Good afternoon, perhaps good morning or even good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And on behalf of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this edition of PON Live, featuring renowned psychologist and Nobel Prize laureate in economics, Daniel Kahneman. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I am the managing director of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School. For nearly 40 years now, the program on negotiation has led the world in research, curriculum development, and executive education trainings related to the fields of negotiation, mediation, and conflict resolution. At PON, we work to help people solve problems, build successful relationships, and deal productively with conflict. And to achieve this, we leverage the power of our incredible faculty and researchers from all across our university consortium of Harvard, MIT, and Tufts, as well as from other institutions in the Boston area and beyond. In pre-pandemic times, we welcomed participants and community members from all across the world to our classrooms in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or to the programs we usually deployed across, across the globe. But today we are really delighted to have expanded our reach to a series of virtual PON live events, such as this one in what we've come to think of as our online classroom. Today's event is hosted jointly by PON, as well as the greater negotiation community from across Harvard. And we are honored today, especially to be joined by Harvard University president, and I'm quite proud to say a lifelong friend of PON, Lawrence Backow, from whom you will hear in just a moment. I would also like to acknowledge the Harvard College Negotiation Club who conceived of and planned today's event. You will be hearing from some of their members later on in the program. Their faculty advisor, Daniel Shapiro, is a PON faculty member and associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. He's the moderator of today's event, and it is my pleasure now to cede to him the virtual Zoom floor. Dan. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's an honor and a thrill to be a part of this special event. Welcome, Professor Kahneman. Welcome all of you I see in the chat room. I should say welcome to all of you from around the world. We're joining on Zoom and via our live streaming platform. As a quick overview, this program started out as a conversation between myself and Nim Ravid, a Harvard College student and a member of the Undergraduate Negotiation Club. We were recently discussing Nim's research on the role of anchoring in negotiation, and we got crazy enthused at the idea of inviting the world's expert on human decision-making and bias to learn from his insights on the intersections between decision-making and negotiation. And Professor Kahneman, we are honored and grateful for the opportunity to have today's discussion. As quick background, this event is going to be organized into three parts. First, I'll be exploring with Professor Kahneman his theories on judgment and decision-making and their connections to negotiation. Next, a panel of Harvard College students steeped in both Professor Kahneman's research and in negotiation theory, we'll be offering and exploring with, Prof with Professor Kahneman a targeted set of questions. And then finally, we'll have a Q&A. For those of you on Zoom, please input your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of the chat. This will allow your fellow attendees to upvote if they have the same question. And now, it is my great honor and pleasure to pass the microphone to Harvard University's president, Lawrence Bacow, himself a celebrated economist and longtime friend of the program on negotiation, President Bacow will be doing us the great honor of introducing mm -hmm. Professor Kahneman. Thank you very much, um, Dan. Uh, first, it's wonderful to be back here at the program on negotiation with all of you, at least virtually. Um, I first want to thank Nim Ravid for inviting me to say a few words uh, about our distinguished guest. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to say, um, I was thinking about how some words, at least in the English language, just sort of naturally go together. Um, you know, uh, sometimes it's people, Simon and Garfunkel, sometimes it's food, sort of macaroni and cheese, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, but then there are other words that didn't naturally come together until somebody put them together. Uh, and here I'm thinking about economics and psychology. Uh, today, this, this combination is, is something that we take for granted. Um, we have a whole field of behavioral economics. But 50 years ago, this was not, in fact, uh, the case. Um, together with his uh, longtime uh, late collaborator, 
uh, Amos Tversky, um, Danny Kahneman really changed how we think about economics in psychology. Uh, he really changed social science. He changed the way we think about ourselves, um, how we think about our lives. Uh, when I grew up studying um, economics, it was all the rational actor model. And, and of course, we, we now know, we now understand that the economic choices that we make depend upon how people actually think. Um, and that, of course, is very much steep in and dependent upon um, how the brain processes information, um, the fact that we do not um, behave rationally all the time, or uh, maybe even some of the time. That insight, I think, continues to create tremendous and vigorous academic dialogue uh, and really to shape the world in which we live. Uh, and that is indeed the work um, of, of our distinguished guest today. So it, it's really my great pleasure to welcome back to Harvard, uh, the recipient of the, the Nobel Prize, uh, Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, best-selling author of a book I suspect most of us have read, Thinking Fast and Slow, as well as many other academic papers that some of us have met, read, uh, the Eugene Higgins Professor of Psychology Emeritus and the Professor of Psychology and Public Affairs Emeritus at Princeton University and namesake together with Ann Treisman of that great institution's Center for Behavioral Sciences. So um, great pleasure to welcome back to Harvard, Professor, Professor Daniel Kahneman. And Dan, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you to moderate um, the discussion with Professor Kahneman. Thank you, Larry. Professor Kahneman, Danny, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining for this event and let's get started. For starters, how did you get interested in human judgment and decision-making? Well, I think I had some interest in, in the psychology of thinking as a teenager. Uh, and my interest actually began, I think, because I discovered that I was interested in philosophical questions, but really in the psychological side of them. So I was less interested in whether or not God exists than in why people believe in it, uh, in him or her. Um, I was less interested in what good and bad are than I was interested in indignation. So uh, I, I was a psychologist from an early age, I think. And my work, but I didn't start out my academic career working on judgment and decision-making. That happened when I met, when our, my collaboration with Amos Tversky began, and it really began almost accidentally. So, um, but it shaped, it certainly shaped my life and my career from that point on. And I'd love to have us move in a few minutes to that collaboration because it sounds so special, but first I'm wondering, over the years, what have been some of the dominant questions that have consumed your curiosity and why those questions? It sounds like from an early age, there was a lot of psychological, there were a lot of psychological questions that was sort of consuming your mind. Well, uh, I think I was interested in, in errors and illusions from fairly early in my, my military service in the Israeli army. I spent some time in the psychology branch and uh, and we were assessing candidates for officer for officer training school, and I I was puzzled by a real paradox that I felt that whenever I would interview one of these candidates, I had the feeling that I knew their mind, and yet the statistics indicated that we were not just not very good at predicting what actually would would happen to them if they went to officer training school. And I, I think that's the first psychological concept I really invented. And I call that the illusion of validity. And this was something that was happening to me that I was very curious about. And yes. then I, I went on to do other things. But when Amos Tversky and I began our work together, the illusion of validity, of course, uh, came up. And so in terms of I've clearly been interested in, in, in flaws of judgment and in particular in flaws in my own judgment mm. and in my own cognitive illusions, uh, you know, 
for a long time. What are one or two of those that have struck you that you've noticed some of your own cognitive biases? Well, I think the I think the one that has struck me the most is what we've called non-regressive prediction. That is, you're given very little information. I mean, uh, my favorite example is still one that I used in Thinking Fast and Slow, which is that Julie is a graduating senior at a university. I'm going to tell you one fact about her. And this is that she read fluently when she was age four. What is her GPA? And, and the odd thing is that people have a sense that a number comes immediately to mind. And we actually know where that number comes from and how it is produced. And, and this is that you get an impression of precocity and intelligence from a reading fluently at age four. That is sort of translated into something that must be like a percentile score. And then that percentile score is translated back into a GPA so that you match the GPA, your impression of how good a GPA it is to how impressive her reading aptitude is. All of this happens unconsciously and it leads to a prediction that is really absurd because the, the amount of information that you get from the statement about how, how early she read is really not enough to support a, a prediction. You're better off saying she probably had pretty much the average grade at, at her university, maybe a little over because maybe she was a little precocious. But so that non-regressive prediction, I think has been the phenomenon that I've been the most curious about. Mm -hmm. And with all of these kinds of observations in mind, you've developed a very compelling framework to understand how our humans who are human minds that we think. And my sense is it also sheds a lot of light on how we make decisions when we negotiate. Could you help us understand what those two systems are and why they're useful for decision-making? Well, uh, in the first place, let me correct one thing. The, uh, the, the part of the book that I wrote, Thinking Fast and Slow, that has, uh, that has had the most impact is an idea that is not mine. Um, the idea that you know, you can talk about two systems of the mind, it's two system theory. I borrowed it from other people. I, I borrowed the name system one and system two from somebody else. Right. And what, what happened, uh, and so what are those two systems? Well, one is thinking fast and automatically and intuitively and associatively, and the other is slower and associated with efforts and, and more with sequential reasoning, not just not necessarily with 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 reason, not necessarily with accuracy, but with a different type of thinking. So that's a distinction. And and the next idea is that a lot of what happens that well first, when we think about ourselves, we think of ourselves as if we were system two. That is, system two is me. That's the conscious me. That's that's the reasoning me. That's but in fact, a lot of what I am and a lot of what I think is actually produced by that system, one of which I'm barely aware and which produces emotions, tentative uh, intuitions about the world, impressions, which in general, I endorse. That is, I consciously endorse the product of an associative process that I'm not aware of. And in negotiations, it is sort of, you know, as, as in, in everything else, it is sort of interesting to see what are the intuitive responses, what comes first, and whether or not you actually follow your intuitions in, in negotiating, or you control it and actually negotiate with more of a system two operation, uh, that's, that I think is, is an interesting problem. And it's fairly clear that good negotiators, uh, I think, are in control. Mm -hmm. and, and being in control, meaning that, that their system too is at work. They do not say anything that comes to mind. They do not uh, come with their first impulses. There is some mediation going on. 
and that that makes negotiation a particularly interesting case of the interaction between those two systems. So there's some self, some control or an awareness of what's going on in system one. The system two is very active in that process, and that's a good thing. Ultimately, can I, I'd love to pick up on that because I've encountered a lot of negotiators who trust their intuition and rely on it to make important decisions under situations where there's a lot of uncertainty. And even working recently with a senior official who said he walks into meetings, immediately makes gut judgments about who to trust, who not to trust. And in my mind, I'm thinking maybe he is picking up on some subtle behavioral clues that demonstrate distrust, but maybe he's falling into a lot of system one traps. When should we trust our intuition? Well, uh, that's a difficult question, um, but I think there is an answer about a certain type of situations in which we definitely can trust our intuitions. And we can trust our intuitions when there is a regularity in the world, when we have had a lot of practice at, and the, the opportunity to uh, sort of detect that regularity and typically, and also it's a, a condition of getting fairly rapid feedback on whether your impressions or your intuitions are, are correct or not. So uh, clearly our intuitions when we drive are excellent. I mean, we know we have intuitions about what comes after the next curve, where we have intuitions about the driver next to us. Uh, clearly, Anyone who you know has a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend knows that one word on the telephone uh, and, and you know their mood. So there is something that you know. And you have a lot of practice in that, that satisfies all three conditions. Mm. Now, when the three conditions are not satisfied, we can still be have the same feeling of knowing and, and, and the same confidence that we know. But this is where uh, people, I think, should be wary of their intuitions, because in fact, we are not terribly good at picking up cues about who is trustworthy or not. And, uh, and our first intuitions are not necessarily the best uh, in that context. And so being slow and more critical and asking yourself, what is the quality of the evidence on which I'm basing that judgment, I think, is useful in, in, the, in a context where thinking slow is really important because, uh, because you cannot assume that you're on the same side as the person who is, who is on the other side. Which brings me back to what you mentioned a little bit earlier about some of your early work in building an interview system to evaluate candidates for combat duty. I was wondering if, if you could say more about what that experience was like and what the lessons were that you derived through that entire process? Uh, well, that, that turned out to be uh, an important chapter in my life and one to which I, I just returned in, in the last years, uh, my God, uh, 65 years later. Um, I was, so I was a junior officer in the Israeli army. I was a lieutenant. I was 21 years old. And I was assigned the task of setting up an interviewing system for the Israeli army. It sounds ridiculous, but you know the the state of Israel was uh, 1954, six years old. At the time, everybody was improvising everywhere, and and I was the best trained psychologist in the Israeli army at the time with a BA. So, uh, and what I did was I. I was given a book which turns out to be a classic in psychology by Paul Meal on clinical and actuarial judgment. And I read that book with care and it shaped my, my understanding of, of, of people. And I set up an interview, which is not directly, but it, it was clearly inspired by Meal's book. Uh, and the idea was to fight the halo effect and mm -hmm. not to form uh, not to trust your global judgment and, in, and the impressions that you form of people. But I, I set up six separate criteria that would be important to a soldier in combat, uh, you know, a, a, 
I mean, I think sociability was one, responsibility was another. There was something that was called masculine pride, which was not shocking uh, at the time. And, and an interview system, I set up the interview system that people ask questions about those six traits and evaluated those six traits one at a time. And, and it, at that point, I thought this is it, we'll take the average of those six ratings. But I had interviewers who were actually going to follow up on this and, and they rebelled because <laughs> they had been trained to trust their intuition. There had been an interview, a much looser interview system in place that they had experience with and that allowed them to, to guess to think, you know, to apply their intuition. And I distinctly remember one of them saying, you're turning us into robots. <laughs> uh, and so I offered a, a compromise and the compromise was, and I really remember what it was, you do, as I told you, you, you generate those six ratings and you try to be reliable. Don't try to be valid at this stage, just but when you're done, close your eyes and how good a soldier will, how good a combat soldier will this person be? It turned out a few months, I thought that I was doing it just to make them feel good. Right. But a few months later, when we got data on the validity of our interview, turned out that it was moderately valid, certainly much more than the previous one, but it turned out in particular that the intuitive response was actually very good. And it was as good as the average of the six judg judgment, the six prior judgment, and it added content so that the intuition, the global impression that people had, uh, had some validity in addition to you know, the, the straight arithmetic average. Now, as it happens in the last few years, I've gone back to exactly that problem uh, we this year we published a book with two collaborators, uh, Olivier Siboni and Cass Sunstein, on called noise, and we describe we propose the setup for making decisions that is an application of that very same idea: break up the problem, evaluate each aspect of the problem, but when you are done, you can have more trust in your intuition. And the idea is delay your intuition because intuition in general makes us jump to conclusions. And after we jump to conclusion, there is a well-known bias, a confirmation bias that sets in. And so in, I think there is research on interviewing that typically in an unstructured interview, the interviewer forms an impression of, of the candidate within the first two or three minutes. But when the rest of the interview justifying that impression, which is not very useful. Mm -hmm. So delaying intuition is, that's, so that's what happened then and, and I'm still, I'm, you know. No, it's, it's brilliant. So if I'm understanding, it's gather as much information as you reasonably can, understand the context and within that space, now bring the intuition in because you know, you know what's going on, you know the context. And, and because you have broken up the problems into its elements mm. and the, making the judgments independent of each other. Mm -hmm. This is like fighting the halo effect. This is yeah. trying not to allow your first impressions to guide your judgments <laughs> of other information that you receive. So uh, I, I haven't had a better idea on that problem you know, for, for the what? 65 years. No, I think it's brilliant. It actually reminds me of one of our, um, uh, of the late uh, decision theorist, Howard Rafa, uh, who I'm sure you've had connections with. Uh, years back, I was having lunch with him and I remember asking him, uh, where does emotion fall into the decision sciences? And he said to me, well, when I was about to marry my then girlfriend, he said, I put together an elaborate decision-making tree. I plotted out all the pros and cons. And then he said, and then I looked in my heart and realized I love this woman and want to marry her. <laughs> He's sort of following your advice, I think. Is that true? Well, uh, I think he did without knowing it. 
because know, yeah. my the, my version of of the story was he said, "Well, this is serious." Or <laughs> as, he, <laughs> as I've heard, this is a serious matter, you know. So my emotions are, but in fact, yeah. having drawn the pros and cons must have had some influence mm. on his judgment. So mm -hmm. his judgment was informed by the by the list of pros and cons. So I right. really read the, the Rafer story differently from mm. the way that it's commonly understood that yes. when it's important, you should trust your gut. I say when it's important, you should inform your gut and mm -hmm. then trust. It. So that's, uh, and I think that's what happened to Howard Rafer, although I'm not sure that this is what he meant when he told you the story. Right, right. No, so, so if I'm hearing you correctly, the sequencing matters, the ana analysis first, and then bring in the intuition afterwards. That's right. Uh, let me move it a, a slight to, to a different place to some of what I understand to be the theoretical roots of your theory. Uh, in a conversation you had with our colleague Max Benjamin at the Harvard Business School a number of years back, I was excited to learn that, as I understand it, your favorite idea in psychology comes from, quote unquote, your intellectual grandfather, Professor Kurt Lewin. Who, and that excited me in part because I find Lewin's work to be utterly profound and insightful for conflict resolution. And I, I, he discusses how to achieve behavioral change via a theory that sits right at the heart of psychology and negotiation as well. Could you describe Lewin's theory and how it's influenced your own well, thinking? I can't describe all of Lewin's theory. But yeah, no, no, or maybe the force field theory. Very he was a very important figure when I, in my development as an undergraduate, I happened to have as a teacher, someone who had been a student of Kurt Lewin. And apparently Kurt Lewin was a very charismatic person and everybody who had been uh, his student, uh, I mean, years afterwards, uh, when I would meet people who had been his students, you would ask them a question and they would say, well, I wonder what he would have said about it. So he, hmm. he had that kind of influence. Now, his, the idea that he had was to view behavior as an equilibrium between opposing forces. So when you're driving on the, on the freeway at a certain speed, there are certain forces that would drive you to, to drive faster. There are other forces that are driving you to drive slower, and where you drive is an equilibrium between those opposing forces. Mm -hmm. That's a view of behavior which is by itself not, not common, I think. But then the insight that follows is that if you want to influence a person's behavior, like their driving speed, there are two ways that, that you can do it. You can increase the driving forces or you can reduce the restraining forces. And the insight was, and the, the image that I still have is that you have like a board and, a, and it's, there are two springs pushing it on both sides. And you can either strengthen one spring and push the other one in, or you can loosen one spring, weaken it, and, and you achieve the same result. And there is an interesting difference that when you're adding to the driving forces at the point of equilibrium, there is a lot of stress on that board. When you, when you get to the same point by reducing restraining forces, there is less stress than there was before. So there is an advantage at reducing restraining forces. What that means in practical terms is if you want to affect someone's behavior in a particular direction, the first question that you should ask is, why don't they do it? Those are the restraining forces. Why don't they do what I want to do? And what can I do to make it easier for them to get where I want them to go? And this is really not intuitive. The first impulse is to think of driving forces. But this idea that you, be, you begin by asking why not instead of why, and what can I do to make things easier, um, turns out, you know, I think it's the best idea in, that I had in psychology and that I learned about in psychology. When I taught in at 
the Woodrow Wilson School, what was then called the Woodrow Wilson School, but uh, in, in Princeton, I taught psychology in the, the program. <clears throat> that was my first lesson mm. because I really thought that's fundamental. And it's clearly very, it's clearly at the core of the idea of negotiation mm -hmm. uh, that you, instead of <clears throat> threatening. And there is an interesting point that, that uh, one tends to forget, which is driving forces includes promises, threats, and arguments. All three of those are driving forces. The restraining forces, reducing the restraining forces typically means changing the environment so as to make it easier for the other side to move in the direction that you want to move. And Just, uh... Does that also mean the cognitive environment? I mean, in a sense, it's the basis of a lot of your work, that insight in the sense that you're trying to uncover and eradicate biases and noise in a very real sense. It's a Lewinian styled effort to remove the constraining forces of rational decision-making in our heads or is that way an overstretch? <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's an overstretch. Fair uh, enough. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it hasn't been, I don't think, well, the reason is that when I've thought of biases and of noise, of mistakes of judgment, I haven't thought of them in the context of mitigation. Mm. It's, mitigation for me is a, is a separate problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's diagnosis, really. It's just looking and wondering, you know, where does that behavior come from? So I don't think that uh, that, I, that aspect of my work has been driven by good loop. But I should add, that nudges are Lewinian. I mean, nudges are a direct application and indeed Dick Thaler and I think Cass Hunstein as well, uh, describe nudging as making it easier for people to do what you hope they will do. So uh, there is a continuity there. And I'd love to move back to your collaboration with Professor Tversky, Amos Tversky. Your theories have had a major global impact. And a lot of these ideas were developed in collaboration with Professor Tversky. Negotiation is largely about collaboration. You've had such an unusual, special collaboration that produced so many seminal ideas. Could you take us back in time and help us understand what made that collaboration work? Well, uh, you know, luck, I would say, uh, we, we happened to like each other a lot. Mm -hmm. And we just really enjoyed each other's company. So uh, when we were in part at parties, that was sort of ridiculous because we would spend most of the day together. But if we met each other at the party in the evening, we tended to gravitate toward each other and continue the conversations. So we were very interested in each one of us and what the other was thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we liked each other, we were, and because we interested in, in each other, we were never bored. Mm -hmm. And when you're not bored, you have infinite patience. And we were mm -hmm. never in a hurry. Uh, that was really part of it. Never in a hurry. I almost had the phrase, let's get it right. That was really very important for us. And we had rules that when we disagreed, uh, we would continue debating until we agreed. Mm. And there were just two exceptions to that. Uh, yes. uh, one was about who to cite, and the other one was about grammar. And in the questions of whether or not to cite someone, Amos had the casting vote. Grammar, I had the casting vote. And everything else we had to agree on. Now. We complemented each other, but we were sufficiently similar to understand each other and sufficiently different to mm. add to each other. So, you know, it's a, collaborations of this type are very rare. There is no recipe for them. And when it happens, you know, you're the beneficiary of a miracle. And that's sort of how I view myself. Did you ever have conflict between the two of you? How did you deal with some of the deeper differences that you had? Uh, anchoring, as, as that came up earlier, was one 
one topic on which we did not agree. Uh, it's a very rare, really, <laughs> quite a rare topic. We, yeah. we didn't agree, we had different views. And there are two major theories of anchoring today. Um, and one is anchoring and adjustment, that you adjust from the anchor until you find uh, some point that is acceptable. And the other one is anchoring a suggestion. Mm. That this is just, that there is a mechanism of suggestion. I think today the suggestion uh, idea is more prevalent, but at the time, uh, you know, there was an advantage, a clear advantage of specificity to, to the idea of anchoring and adjustment. And when we wrote our paper, um, in science that appeared in 1974, which is the only time that we mention anchoring. We mentioned anchoring and adjustment after a lot of debate, but we never wrote a paper about anchoring. Although we ran many experiments, we never wrote a paper because we really never entirely agreed on that topic. So there, that was one unresolved matter. You know, it, was, it wasn't very important, but it actually matters because I think we wrote the paper on heuristics and biases, but anchoring, as I view it now, is not a heuristic. Mm. So, uh, the, so it was a profound disagreement, but yes. also it didn't matter. And it seems like you have a strong commitment to collaborations to produce new ideas, to build the ideas of science. I think about your work with, um, uh, with with, uh, with uh, Professor Klein, for example, others who said, no, I don't quite buy everything that Professor Kahneman says. And instead of rejecting them, my sense is you've embraced and said, well, let's learn together. Is that true? Could you explain more about your theory of collaboration? Well, uh, I have coined a concept. It turned out somebody had had the idea before, but the word, I think, I didn't know of his word. And I coined the concept of adversarial collaboration. Hmm. And, and, and that idea of adversarial collaboration was because I had been involved in a few controversies, never actually on the aggressive side, but some people had uh, in, initiated a controversy about work that Amos and I had done typically. And, and I hated it. I hated being angry. And and there is a lot of anger in controversies. And I thought this is absurd. And it generates heat and no light. All those critiques and rejoinders and replies are, are a pernicious waste of time. And instead of that, I said, you know, when you don't agree with someone, let's try to get together. We're both, you know, we're both in the same field. We both have a commitment ultimately to the truth. Yes. Let's let's not necessarily, we're not going to agree at the end, but let's try to understand each other mm -hmm. and, and push that as far as it will go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've been involved in a number of those. Uh, I'm involved in, in an adversarial collaboration now. Uh, and, you know, and, and actually, I thought it was not catching on. Uh, I thought that this is too difficult and it's not happening. But I learned recently that there is an adversarial collaboration going on in studying one of the major problems in psychology today, which is the nature of consciousness and mm -hmm. the, the neuroscience of consciousness. Turns out there are two opposing ideas, two big opposing ideas. Mm -hmm. and the people got together with others, with the help of others, philosophers, neuroscientists, and they planned a series of experiments to try to resolve the issue. And mm. in January, there's going to be a meeting of both sides where they're going to uh, thrash it out. And, and I was honored to be invited to open that meeting. Mm. And that's because they designated it as an adversarial collaboration. So maybe that concept, uh, is is more viable than I had thought. No, it's, it's brilliant, and it's, it's it's brilliant, and it sounds practical. Any advice if someone tries to take on that concept? So, one of some of the scholars or practitioners listening, I'm going to try an adversarial collaboration. 
what advice do you have for them to try and make it as successful as possible so that it doesn't turn into purely an adversarial <laughs> uh, situation? I mean, the, in, well, I've had a few examples of that. So one of them started truly adversarial. That is, it started essentially with a quarrel. I was very angry when it started. And, and, and I think there was anger on the other side. Mm. And and I proposed as a method that we write a joint paper in two voices. But mm. first, the first part of the paper is let's write everything that we agree on. Mm. And then let's work and then let's explain our disagreements in the context of what we agree on. And that turned out to be very productive. Yes. And you know, and we ended up on speaking terms and uh, in other in other cases, actually, uh, I've ended up friends with yes. fellow collaborators. Actually, with Gary Klein, we had a collaboration on the problem that you raised before. When yes. can we trust our intuitions? Mm -hmm. That took us six years. Uh, and we wrote a paper, the title of which was a failure to disagree. Mm. Uh, because... And the interesting thing is, actually, we still disagreed, but we had found a lot of stuff on which we could agree. And it turns out that the three conditions that I mentioned earlier uh, for valid intuition, they came out of that adversarial collaboration. Mm -hmm. That is, we both could agree that those three conditions are important and uh, that unless they're satisfied, intuition should not be trusted. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, and we've remained friends ever since. Is coming to see me next week. So um, <laughs> that's brilliant. So it really is a collaborative. I mean, the collaborative component yeah. is very truly there as well. Yeah. I, I want to move us in two different directions. We have about five minutes until I want to bring the, the student panelists in. Um, first question uh, When I was reading Thinking Fast and Slow, you kept presenting me, the reader, with riddles to think through like whether it's more likely for the letter K to be the first or the third letter in a word. And I kept falling for your traps. <laughs> and it seems to me like your books, your articles, your pedagogy, you, you found a way to engage people in the methods uh, and, and, and to engage people in your material uh, very actively. Uh, and just reading the book, you have the riddle and then you are walking me through exactly what I've been thinking, what traps I've fallen into and I've noticed that even when we, we've been talking together and previous to this today as well, that it's been uh, a, a means that you've perhaps used consciously to try to help express your thoughts. Just, what's your theory well, of engaging well, people uh, in, in ideas? Well, there are several things to say about this. In the first place, uh, yes, indeed, we use this as as a technique, and we used this from our very first paper to present the questions, the same questions to the participants in our experiments and, and to the readers. So they are set out in a different front and, and they're very clearly set up as a question to the reader. So the readers are participants in our experiments. Our experiments are really demonstrations and we didn't invent that. This is in every textbook on psychology. There is a chapter on Gestalt effects on figure ground mm -hmm. and, and, on, uh, and on other Gestalt phenomena. And, and the explanation is the figures are there and you see, you see the demonstration of this. And I was very influenced by that when I was a, a young student. I, I loved that. There was another input to that decision, which was something that impressed me in the 1960s, very early on. I saw the dissertation of the famous Walter Michel, the late Walter Michel. Mm -hmm. uh, and in his dissertation, he would ask children two questions. Um, and one of them was, you can have one, one lollipop now or two lollipops tomorrow, which you prefer. Now that question is very simple. And, and the other one was there is, there is a fairy who can turn you into whatever you want to be. And where do you want to be? And 
if you answer it by the name of a profession or some achievement related trait, mm -hmm. uh, you got a one, otherwise zero. Turns out those questions predicted everything inside. And, and mm -hmm. I fell in love with the idea of the psychology of single questions. That is, you, you ask a single question and it makes a point. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, that happened, that was in the background when Amos and I began to work together and we naturally fell into that, that mode of work. Mm. And, and I should add, we've been considered you know, quite successful in, because we influence people outside the field. So you know, what's, it, what's the secret? Well, the secret is this, that you can ask questions of people who are not in your discipline and they'll be interested in those questions more than in any experiment you've described. But I want to qualify this. This is the only field, we happen luck to be extraordinarily lucky. This is the only field in which you can do that. It's not that other psychologists, you know, haven't had, you know, it's their problem that they, they're not using that technique. That technique is unique. And, and we were just lucky to, um, to have chosen a problem to which that technique was, was it's workable. Yes. And before we move on to the student panel, we have about one minute. You, what's one of the things that's most striking to me and special about your work is that you're a psychologist who has influenced everything from economics to business to crisis management, negotiation, healthcare, and on and on. And I was wondering what your advice would be for young scholars who strive to make an interdisciplinary impact. Maybe just a, a, a few sentences of thought, perhaps. Don't have that aspiration. Mm. Just do something interesting. And yes. you know, if, if it happens to, to, to deserve interdisciplinary impact, try to write without jargon. I mean, mm. that is very important. Try to be accessible, but trying to influence other disciplines, I really think is essentially a waste of time. Mm. So, Amos and I never intended to have any influence on economics or on any other discipline. We were psychologists, we were doing psychology. And, and the fact that some economists found it interesting and useful, that was a bonus. And you know, it was, it's quite wonderful that it happened, but it was not what we were working for. And we didn't have that ambition. And I really don't recommend this as a form of ambition to try to be influential. Mm. You know, if your ideas deserve it, and if you're very, very lucky, because mm. deserving is not enough, uh, if you're very lucky, your ideas might be influential. So sharpen your ideas, move and with what your interest yeah. and your passion is. And if I understand your relationship with uh, Professor Tversky as well, look, for, you know, if it's a fun chemistry driven relationship, all the better. <laughs> yeah. Look, Danny, thank you. Let's move now to the next part of our program. We have three Harvard College students steeped in both your theories and in negotiation theory. And they each have you know, thought through a question that they wanted to ask you and discuss with you. We're gonna start with Nim Ravid, who you are you know, acquainted with, he helped to make today happen, whose research focuses on the role of anchoring in negotiation. Nim, let me turn the floor to you, please. Thank you so much, Professor Shapiro. Uh, my name is Nim, and I'm a freshman at Harvard College studying social studies and psychology. And Professor Gahnman, on the behalf of the Harvard student community, I'd first like to thank you. Um, I wanted to share, uh, to share with you that many of my friends who are currently watching us have been studying your uh, research in so many different contexts, from psychology to economics, to philosophy, to social sciences. And to me, it reflects the profound impact of your work across disciplines. And even after what you've said now, I think it's really powerful and across disciplines, continents, and generations. Um, I also want to personally thank you. Engaging with your research and talking to you as we've prepared for this event has inspired me personally to delve deeper into decision-making theory and work to apply behavioral insights to solve real, real world problems. Now, my question is about loss aversion, a concept that you discuss in thinking fast and slow as a part of prospect theory. Now, loss aversion is the idea that we experience losses more severely than equivalent gains. And your book discusses how this bias can prevent people from making rational decisions, and it motivated me to further explore the role of loss aversion in negotiations. 
And since I've learned of loss aversion, I keep seeing how people reject great deals simply out of fear that they're losing better ones. So in the context of negotiations, how can we, we reduce the distorting and sometimes paralyzing effects of loss aversion? Well, I think it is certainly true in the, in the context of negotiation, loss aversion takes the form of concession aversion. It's that the, my concessions are, are more painful to me than they are agreeable to you. And, and it's that asymmetry that, that causes a lot of impasses in, in negotiation, uh, there's no question. And, and so the starting point from which concessions are made is very salient. And clearly, if you negotiate one item at a time, then, uh, then that creates loss aversion on both sides. Uh, and, and it's very difficult to reach agreement. So clearly the, the lesson of that is that you should not try to the extent possible, you should try to think not of the changes from the status quo, which almost inevitably will involve concessions on your part, but to focus on the final state and to focus on the totality, on the totality of uh, you know, the various aspects of the deal that you're trying to form. And focusing on, on final states rather than on changes, that is a general idea that is part of the advice of people who try to be rational, is try to think not of, the, not of how you, you will get there and not of the process of getting there. Try to think of where you want to go. Try to think of the final state. So uh, yes. That's, I think loss of aversion is critical to negotiations. And, and the only way to avoid it is not to think of one concession, but to think of a package and as a unified package, which is the final state. Thank you so much. Love that. So next, we're going to hear, and first, thank you, Nim. Uh, it was great. Next, we're going to hear from Yura Choi, who is co-president of the Harvard College International Negotiation Program. Yura, you're on. Hello, um, my name is Yura. I'm currently a sophomore at the college studying government, um, East Asian studies and economics. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for visiting us today. Um, when I first studied your work in high school, I would have never imagined that I'd someday have the honor of meeting you, albeit virtually. Um, so my question today, concerns self-knowledge. Um, skilled negotiators often have keen understandings of their own triggers, tendencies, and compulsions. Um, however, the ability to analyze one's own, one's own behavior is a difficult one to master. Um, what advice would you give to help people who have learned about the two systems, judgment heuristics, and biases from your book, but are struggling to more actively, as you write, identify and understand errors of judgment and choice in themselves? Well, you know, the the first advice, of course, is to slow down uh, and not to follow your first impulses because, um, I mean, somebody said, I think it was Oscar Wilde, that never follow your first impulse because it's the good one. But, but that, I, I'm not sure that he was right. I'm not sure that he was joking. Uh, you, you want to slow down. And I think that, and you want to recognize what your impulses are. But the main advice that one would give is, is try to see the situation from the other side of the table. That is, and this is absolutely essential if you're going to make it easy for the other side to accept a new, a new situation. You want to understand their view of the current and their view of the future. And you want to focus on how they view the situation. And if you do that, then your biases will become much less important. I think, I hope. Okay, thank you so much. That was very insightful. So I'd now like to introduce you as well to Lucas Woodley, who is co-president with Yura of the Undergraduate Negotiation Club. He also has a strong interest in economics. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dan. And hello, Professor Kahneman. First, let me just say what an honor this has been. Um, I've read through much of your work and it has been both 
deeply fascinating as well as inspiring. Um, and so thank you so much for taking the time to come speak and share your brilliant insights with all of us today. Um, I'm Lucas, I'm a junior here at the Harvard College um, and I study economics with a secondary in psychology. Um, and my question for you is on the topic of anchoring in a negotiation, is it possible for people to perceive anchoring differently from one another? For example, might one person feel more tied to an early anchor than the other? And if so, what can we do to prevent this difference in perceptions from causing more problems in a negotiation? Well, I mean, anything in negotiations is going to look different from, from the two sides. Now, anchoring, and I mentioned that earlier, anchoring is, in, is a very interesting process. The, and the, uh, the general idea, which I think was articulated by a Harvard professor, Dan Gilbert, was that the first impulse when you hear something is to understand it, you have it has to be plausible. So if you present an anchor that sort of can make sense to the other side, you have achieved quite a bit. And uh, and from that perspective comes the advice uh, for people to present it to be the first one to present an anchor, to present an offer because their offer is probably going to be biased for their side, but it will appear more plausible to the other side if it is in the plausible range. Now, what to do with anchors that are not in the plausible range, that is sort of interesting. And, uh, and when I, I used to teach negotiations, my advice was that when, when the other side presents you with an unreasonable anchor, make a seed. I mean, just refuse to negotiate on that basis. Mm -hmm. uh, Max Bazerman and I uh, came up with something that we published together uh, on this, which was that when the offer that the other side makes is really appears unreasonable, then you should offer final offer arbitration. That is, you should say, well, let's take this to somebody else and let some, this is, I'm going to make an offer. This is your offer. And uh, are you willing to, to go to final offer arbitration? And that is a way of, of putting some pressure on someone to make, to make their first, uh, not to try to anchor you on something that is completely unreasonable, but to become, to, to get into the reasonable range. So I'm not sure that I've answered your question, but I've, I've talked about anchoring in negotiations. Uh, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you for these great questions and Danny for your responses. We are now going to turn to the audience Q&A. Uh, thank you to everyone who has submitted a question on Zoom. We have received an enormous number of excellent questions. We obviously only have a limited amount of time. Uh, so we will try and, um, um, uh, you know, explore as many questions as we can, also looking for themes. And we have had the students looking through the questions to try to find some of those themes. Nim, what's the first question? And could we put Nim back onto the screen if we could? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so you really got uh, great questions. The first one that I'd like to ask you uh, is somewhat of more of a personal question. Uh, so you often say that uh, behind every big success, there is an optimist. And you even refer to optimism as the engine of capitalism. Uh, but you still define yourself as a pessimist. Can you please share it with us why? Well, uh, I, I was not referring to academic successes. I was referring to people who have a vision. I, I was really referring to entrepreneurs. And... And I think that is true that entrepreneurs and people who train the world uh, are normally people who have the wrong idea of their odds and they're wildly optimistic about what they can achieve. And, and this wild optimism and lack of realism uh, is what makes success possible. So, and there is an interesting asymmetry that when you look back at successes, you always find optimists. And yes. when you look, but that is really, not good advice for people that they should be very optimistic and then they'll be successful. When you look forward, the picture looks entirely different about what optimism 
when and why optimism is good, and it's much more nuanced. Thank you. You're, uh, you're on next. So you're, uh, what's the next question that we've come to? Yeah, so one audience member asks, um, can you share some thoughts about the system one and system two in a cultural context? Do people think or negotiate very differently in different cultures in terms of relying on system one versus system two? Well, I have a very simple answer to this question, which is that I don't know how to answer it. Uh, I, I don't have enough information. Um, I'm sure there are differences, but I, I don't have anything intelligent to say about them. Yeah, it, it makes sense. In that case, we can move on to our next question. And Yura, do you have another one prepared yet or should we move on to Lucas next? Um, we're still looking through a second. I think we can move to. Okay, so Lucas, you're on now. And we're trying to keep this lively, Danny, with all the different people I, coming and going. I can see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of our audience members asks, what are your thoughts about bias, perception, and decision-making with regards to issues of race? And how does, our, how does the shaping of our system one thinking contribute to racing and or stereotype? I, I'm not sure I heard contributes to what and stereotypes? To racism and or stereotyping. Oh. Well, Again, that's a question on which I don't have anything to say that is going to be surprising or particularly interesting. I mean, it's, it's very clear that uh, we have stereotypes of groups. That is, but stereotyping in a way is an inherent part of, of human thinking. That is, it is like categorizing. So we have stereotypes of tables, we have stereotypes of, of cupboards, we, and we have stereotypes of groups. And in a way, uh, having stereotypes or having a prototype is unavoidable. And, and here I know that this is a sensitive topic and so on, but if you think about it, when we think about categories, of whether we think of vehicles or cars or groups, we generate a prototype and people think in terms of prototypes. Now, so there are going to be prototypes of groups. People have prototypes of Harvard students. People have prototypes of you know, Harvard professors. And, and it's, it's inevitable that you'll have prototypes. Now, whether the those prototypes are fair and accurate is one issue. And, and whether to act on them is a completely separate issue. So you may have the prototype and you may know that this, this kind of prototype is offensive to people, this kind of prototype is hurtful to people and you don't want to act on it. So I draw, I'm in that sense, and perhaps I'm old fashioned because I, I see that the reaction to racism is, tends to be more extreme than the position that I'm, that I'm taking here. I'm, I'm taking the position that having prototypes is inevitable. And I, I would not judge somebody for having a prototype of a group, even if that prototype is unfavorable. I don't think that people can be blamed for having a, uh, for, for the prototypes they have. They can be blamed for not trying when they have a negative prototype or when they have an exceptional prototype, not, have, not trying to learn. And they certainly can be blamed for any action they take, including speaking. But I think that blaming people for the thoughts that come to their mind is, I mean, it's it's not something that I think is useful. All said, thank you. Great, thank you. Nim. Yes, so you've said that, that reading your book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, can make people improve, uh, perform educated gossip, but not necessarily to become better decision makers. You also joke that while you wrote the book, your decision making didn't improve at all. And we understand that being able to identify a bias doesn't necessarily mean avoiding it. And similarly, in negotiation, people often recognize their irrationalities, but still engage in it. So how can we avoid falling into the biases that we recognize? 
are there biases that are easier to avoid? Well, you know, again, this is a question to which I'm not sure I have an interesting answer. Um, being aware of biases can, I think, be useful, but it's useful only to the extent that you detect in the situation that you are in a situation that biases you. And this is often quite difficult. Slowing down is a very good way of doing it. And getting advice is another way of doing it. And I want to emphasize the getting advice as, as a way of, because I've learned through my contact with a very good friend, which is the category of people that one would should go to advice, to get advice from. And that's a category of people who, who like you and don't care about your feelings. <laughs> and they, they, they want what's good for you, but they really don't care about your feelings right now. And I have in mind Richard Thaler, who happens to be my best living friend. And, and he likes me and he doesn't care about my feelings and, and he gives me good advice. So being very somebody who identifies too much with my loss aversion or my emotions at the moment is not going to give me optimal advice. It's somebody who sees the bigger picture and sees where you are going and really doesn't care about what makes me miserable right now uh, is going to give me better advice. So just to follow up on that for a moment, if you were to advise, if I'm walking into a negotiation and it's an important negotiation, there's a lot on the line. Before I walk into that negotiation and even throughout, one, I should be seeking advice from those who will give me transparent, objective um, perspective. How do I, just if, if it's okay to push the question a little bit more, how do I, there are a lot of biases that have been uh, uh, um, elucidated. How do I watch out that I don't fall prey to those biases? Do I go down a list of them? Do I, want, do I know that I am more susceptible to overconfidence or some other bias? How should I practically move forward in a real situation like that? Well, I think that the primary bias that would affect people in negotiations is one that I, I have written nothing about, and it's called my side bias. <laughs> and, and its implication for negotiations is obvious. Uh, and, and that's the one you want to get rid of primarily. Mm -hmm. If you can get rid of, of that bias, uh, you, you are going to be a much better negotiator. Yeah, and no one, oh, sorry. Please. Other, you know, the combination, I think, of overcoming the my side bias of being able really to even trying to look at the problem from the perspective of the other side is very useful. The combination of that with, with objective advice mm -hmm. and the objective advice and really trying to anticipate how your offers and your next move are going to be perceived by the other side. Mm -hmm. Because there is one issue that I think is poisonous for negotiations. And this is that we, very often feel that our intentions, especially when they are not bad, are transparent. That is, that, you know, if I, if I really, have, my intentions are good, I expect you to see that. And I'm going to be very offended if I say something, you know, in good faith and you treat it as if it was in bad faith. And that, that is something that people should be able to, uh, to control and get rid of. Uh, and and here, sometimes getting advice would be very useful. How will that look to the other side? And and here you really probably you want to see what is the worst way in which they can interpret what what I'm thinking of. Yes. And taking that as an anchor or taking that as a beginning could be useful advice. And, and, and I, I want to make sure we have time for some more questions. But, but on earlier this week, when you and Nim and I were in conversation, you had mentioned that notion of looking from the other's perspective, and you added two words. And I, I was curious to learn more about that. You said, "Look at the others from at the try and understand the other's perspective 
with sympathy, or you said it sympathetically or with sympathy, it was something like that. Could you break down that last part? What does that mean to you? Because I think that's an important distinction or qualification. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that when, when you are empathetic, I mean, when you have to have empathy for the other side, you have to be able really to, to see the situation as it looks from, from the other side. And that means understanding their, what they want, understanding their emotions. It means uh, anticipating or understanding their anger at you and what you look like from that point of view, from their point of view. And, and you probably look very much worse than you think you are. And uh, so try, this is what I meant by make a serious effort to, to look at it from the other side. Not merely a list of what they want or what their demands are, but of where they come from and especially how they see you. Because that idea that other people see me as I am in the context of conflict and negotiations is I think profoundly wrong. Mm. Brilliant. Yura. Thank you. Um, one popular question we have is, uh, considering what we know about system one and system two in dealing with rational situations like financial decisions, what can you say about these systems when dealing with irrational situations such as heartbreak? Uh, I don't think that, you know, the distinction between system one and system two is, is very, you know, it, that distinction was introduced as a way to, to make cognitive psychology more easily understandable. It's not, you know, it, it, it's not, a, it's a metaphor, it's a way of looking at, at, at cognition. It's not a general view of the world. And my first reaction is that that's, you know, I don't think it really can help you understand heartbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a limited set of things that it can help you with. And I would say heartbreak is not in that set. Lucas. So another popular question that we had is when emotions are high, uh, is there a list of either tricks or phrases or anything that can help calm down the system one of individuals? Well, I mean, uh, we've, we've mentioned that before. I mean, slowing down, sleep on it, get advice get advice from people who are not on your side, but that you trust anyway. And that is really very important because uh, one thing that we know is that getting advice from people who agree with you is not a good idea. It leads to polarization. Cass Sunstein has, has studied that in detail. And so when you have groups of people who agree with each other, the more they discuss, the more extreme they're likely to become. And that's not what you want in the context of negotiations. So you really want advice that, that is likely to be painful. <laughs> it's basically only advice that is slightly painful is going to be useful to you. Uh, advice that you're happy to, to take, you probably don't need. Great. Uh, Nim. Yeah. Uh, so another popular question is regarding also biases. Um, there, are there are biases that are uh, well known and people are very aware of them, like the confirmation bias and the availability bias. Um, but the question is, do you, are there biases that you can think of that people should be more aware of and sort of watch out for? You know, there's an interesting thing, I think, that's happened about the notion of biases over the years that certainly has happened to me. So when, when Amos and I started our work together, uh, we, we thought of three major heuristics. One of them, I think, is not a heuristic anchoring, uh, and representativeness and availability, and of the biases to which they lead. And th those are predictable areas of judgment. My view of heuristics has really changed. And it's sort of interesting because Thinking fast and slow has been read widely, but how much I had changed my mind uh, since the early work has, I think, has largely escaped notice. And 
Macaron view of heuristics, which encompasses the older view, but is different, is that the heuristic is primarily that you don't answer the right question. That is, you're asked about probability and you answer about similarity, or you asked about probability and you answer about availability of instances. But it's also, you are asked about trying to guess somebody's future probability and and all you know is their present uh, future popularity, and all you know is their present popularity, and and you tend to be anchored on that. And there are many situations where we we just don't and we answer a question approximately. We don't really answer the right question, and so that that I think is really important. Uh, thinking about biases. It's not a finite list of biases. I mean, the, I know there are 200 biases listed in Wikipedia. I, I don't I really find that particularly useful. I mean, it's some of them are insightful, but the main thing is, is am I asking the right question? Am I answering the right question? Uh, and if I'm not answering the right question, then probably my answer will be biased. Mm. And, that, that is a, a difference relative to uh, the earlier statements that, that Amos and I had together. And I must say, I appreciate how you live by that approach, that if we ask you a question and you feel it's outside the domain of what you have substantial understanding about, you're, you're, you're vocal about, that's, that's outside my domain. Um, let's move now to Yura. Um, another question we have is, uh, reference, reference points play a key role in decision-making according to prospect theory. In negotiations, we often have multi-dimensional outcome dimensions, such as economic, qualitative, and social outcomes. Um, what are your thoughts on how multiple reference points impact our decisions in negotiations? Well, I think there is a reference point on every attribute that you're negotiating about. So every attribute of of the situation has a reference point. And, and if the reference point in the present situation, then I think it's damaging. I mean, then that's what I was saying earlier, that actually you want to avoid thinking about the present situation. You want to think about the future. So negotiations are future oriented and it's, it's the future that you want to think about. And the less you think about um, and, and reference points typically, their main effect is to induce loss aversion. And so uh, I think that type of thinking that is anchored on, on, for example, thinking about the next contract starting from the existing contract is going to create a lot more problems than looking at contract as if there had been no precedent. Then. That this, by the way, is something that I think is causing some businesses to fail and uh, and new businesses to emerge. Is that when a new business starts, they there is no reference point, so they're free to invent things to invent a new situation. Whereas when you have reference points and you're anchored on them, change is actually much harder. Um, Lucas. So in one of your more recent works, you discussed the idea of noise in human judgment. And one of the things that you advise for combating this is to try to structure things so that we can break down these judgments into smaller, more independent tasks so that we can avoid what you call excessive coherence. My question is, how can you apply this concept when we're thinking about how to structure a negotiation? And does this change when we're in some sort of group negotiation context versus one-on-one? -on -one? Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. Uh, can you just repeat? I got lost in that question. Certainly. So in terms of as we try to structure uh, judgments into more independent tasks, how might we apply yeah. that process of structuring to a negotiation in terms of how we actually go about structuring that negotiation? And would this be the same if we're negotiating as part of a group versus as individuals? Well, uh, 
to the second question first, which I find a little easier. Um, in negotiating as a group, I mean, you know, there, uh, there are costs and benefits to that. And I've mentioned that groups uh, tend to, uh, when they're sufficiently diverse and when people are very free to express dissenting opinions, uh, groups can improve the process and certainly can improve the process of negotiations. And the few people in a group, say, who are able to empathize with the other side are not are often not going to be the most popular members of the group, but they may be the most useful members of the group. So uh, in that sense, there are opportunities for groups that are not available to individuals. The reason that I get stuck on the first question, and I'm just not sure, is that in general, I, I think that uh, breaking the problem up into dimensions is good. Uh, in, but here, it seems to be in conflict, and I, I just can't think on my feet fast enough. It seems to be in conflict with the idea that multiple reference points are bad. So I, I haven't uh, I'm not able to come up with a good answer to the first question. I, I'm sure that there is a way of breaking it up and there probably is a solution to the problem. I couldn't come up with it. We have time for one or two more questions. Nim, you're next. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is about uh, COVID-19 and uh, from the audience, how can we negotiate or maybe convince extreme opponents of vaccinations to make them down that, to make them doubt their own position? I'm not optimistic on that one. Oh. Uh, the, so, you know, I think, I think evidence clearly doesn't work. And in general, you say when evidence doesn't work, stories might work, but, but stories don't seem to work because there are conflicting stories. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that anybody has a good idea that is short of, you know, forcing people uh, to convince people on, on that one, you know, given that so much has been tried and that there's so much good information out there that I don't know how you could add to it. So I don't have a good answer to that question. I wish yeah. I did. You know, if, if, if there was a, a, a good answer, it would have been found. Mm. That's my sense. And, and the fact that the problem is so intractable, uh, it, it means that this this is a space that has been searched, and I don't think there are easy solutions. Yeah, just thinking about it uh, reminds me of the Lewinian idea that we've dis discussed before, and maybe one avenue that uh, we can approach is sort of diminished restraining forces and and uh, uh, sort of ask why they're not doing why they're not doing so so far. Um, uh, I think that's a very good point, and you know the suggestion in that would be. That, and that's a direct implication of Lewinian theory, that when people, when there is a community, uh, you, you really should think of who the leaders are, who the opinion leaders are, and you should think about what will change their mind. You should not pick up members of the community one at a time and try to convince them to, to think differently because they are anchored in their group and you're trying to separate them from their group. So if you could have an impact on, on the leaders, that's what you should try. Uh, and, and this is what doesn't seem to be working in the current situation. And you're uh, the last question, please. Yeah, so this question is a bit more interdisciplinary, but it asks, how do you think that the advent and increased usage of technology impacts system one versus system two thinking? Uh, how does technology? The, how does the advent of technology affect the usage of system one versus system two thinking? Well, I mean, you know, in, I think it's, I think many important decisions are still being made in, in the old fashioned way. That is, there is a lot more information 
and, and a lot more information is being used by leaders. Uh, and whether a um, problem that essentially look unique, appear unique because they're strategic, because they're very important, whether the quality of decision making is improving over time with technology, I think is, a, is an open question. Uh, and and it might have different answers in the business world and 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 in government. I mean, and it's a fascinating question whether the quality of decision making is improving. Here, I don't know of any data, but there, there might be. And in the absence of data, I would be a pessimist. But but that really doesn't mean anything. Well, Danny, let me say a huge thank you. Uh, you have absolutely inspired all of us within the negotiation community and more broadly around the world, everybody who's joining, to further explore your incredible body of research and its implications for helping us improve decision making the content, within the context of negotiation. I am especially just ecstatic that we've been able to bring these undergraduate students into the conversation with you to learn from your insights and more than insights, as I've been listening to you today and studying your work, it's not insights, it is absolutely wisdom. Uh, so on behalf of all of us within the Harvard community uh, and everyone joining around the world, thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn the floor back now to Nicole Bryant, Managing Director of the Program on Negotiation for final remarks. But again, such great gratitude. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been an interesting conversation, except You've often embarrassed me quite a bit, but. Uh... <laughs> well, Professor Kahneman, thank you so much um, for everything that you have given to us you know, today and for your uh, integrity and honesty in answering questions uh, and, uh, and being so willing to give us your time. Thank you also to Professor Dan Shapiro. It is always a pleasure to collaborate with you and special thanks, of course, to President Bacow for having been with us earlier. My deepest gratitude also to our three incredible student panelists. You've seen it in the chat. Everyone is so impressed with you as am I and as are we all. Uh, Nim Ravid, Yura Choi and Lucas Woodley, thank you so much for your role in organizing and facilitating today's event. Having done a number of these, I know myself how it is not always easy and you uh, proved yourselves very worthy. Thank you, of course, as always, to the incredible staff here at the Program on Negotiation, Diane Long, James Kerwin and Anna Chang for all of the behind the scenes hard work that goes into hosting literally hundreds of people on Zoom and live stream. That is not a trivial thing at all. And of course, for all that you do each and every day for the program on negotiation. And my final thanks to the folks who have joined in our incredible participants. Whether you are new to PON or a PON alum, we are grateful to have you as a part of our community. And we look forward to seeing you at future events such as more PON live chats in about 10 days we have uh, another one coming up with a former Harvard Law School Dean, Martha Minow, in conversation with Harvard Law School Professor Gabriella Bloom, or of course, um, at any one of our virtual programs that are coming up over the next couple of months. You see a, a number of them on the screen, including uh, with Dan Shapiro, or we would be delighted to welcome you back in person once we go in person <laughs> starting in May, June, and July in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We cannot wait to see you in a room and have this incredible energy. Until then, you have our deepest gratitude and our best wishes to you wherever you are around the world. Thank you so much. Be well, and we'll see you soon at the program on negotiation. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.